Well, dear students, we have completed, for the most part, our coverage of fundamental analysis. And now in the next two chapters, we'll discuss the two other main st strategies for analysis of stock price behavior. And in this chapter, we'll discuss the efficient market theory, sometimes called the rational market theory. And in our next chapter, chapter eight, we'll discuss technical analysis. And those are both very different than the work we've been doing with fundamental analysis. This chapter will also discuss um, a little bit of a, a psychology with regard to markets. We'll do more in the next chapter. And we'll also spend some time discussing all stars of investing. Because I always believe that if you want to learn how to do something well, look at the people who have done who have gone before you and have done it well stand on the shoulders of giants and and learn from them and you know you might never be as good as they are because they're the, the best of the best but still it's 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 a good way to learn in my humble opinion <clears throat> and so a better name for this chapter might be can you beat the market you'll hear Quite a bit of people, quite, quite a bit about how some people can beat the market. And we'll see some of the attributes of people who have beaten the market over statistically significant periods of time. And speaking of standing on the shoulders of giants, we start with a quote from Sir Isaac Newton, who <clears throat> famously said, I can calculate the movement of the stars, but not the madness of men. And uh, he knew <laughs> firsthand from what from whence he spoke, because he got involved in one of the manias, one of the bubbles of his time, and was of course burnt with a whole lot of other people too. So let's take a look at the random walk theory, theory hypothesis, the rational market theory, the efficient market theory. This is the theory that stock price movements are unpredictable. And you know what? They're right in the short term, as we've seen. But in the long term, no. Well, we certainly hope not. Failure is not an option. People often tell me, well, we can't keep growing forever. And I say, you're absolutely right. But we still got a long way to go globally. I sometimes submit to people that we in the West are far too well off and they quickly counter with saying well you know not everybody in the west is far too well off and i say yeah that's true okay but there's a lot of give and take involved we could certainly do with a whole lot less that we then of what we consider to be completely essential but still yes in the west we have a lot um, much to do <laughs> and in the emerging markets, we have much to do because we will not be happy until everyone has clean water, good food, healthy food, health care, a roof over their heads, clothing, and internet access, of course. <laughs> so we've seen that in the long term, as the global economy has grown, no, it's not random. In the short term, oh yeah, it's crazy. And the efficient market theorists say, that an efficient market, one in which there are large numbers of, of knowledgeable buyers and sellers, all securities reflect all possible information quickly and accurately. So, for example, the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, the major exchanges around the world in Frankfurt, London, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, Australia, you know, all the places we talk about. And even the lesser, uh, uh, even the lesser meaning not as popular, not, not that they're any less important, they're certainly important to the folks in Turkey and South Africa and Pakistan. But when you have a, an efficient market, large numbers of buyers and sellers, then all possible information is quickly and accurately assimilated and securities reflect that information. <laughs> it's not true. Uh, 
for those of you who are um, still are not completely uh, turned off by books, <laughs> one of the books I've been trying to get you to read as a first book is A Random Walk Down Wall Street. And he was one of the original professors. It was started in the, uh, in the laboratory and in, in academia who, who, uh, who came up with the efficient market theories and random walk theories. And he wrote this wonderful book where he skewers the fundamental analysis, he skewers the technical analysis, and he skewers the folks who believe in the efficient market theory. And so please do read it along with One Up on Wall Street. And then eventually you're going to read The Intelligent Investor. Please, someday. Yes. Along with the commentary by Jason Swide. So there are various levels of the market efficiency. And at the time that this was being uh, put together, late 60s, early, throughout the 70s, there was also quite a bit of work in physics. And they had the weak and the strong and the semi-strong. And, and so that you could tell that the efficient market theorists were stealing some from some, some uh, names from the, from the physicists, the weak efficiency hypothesis. Past data on stock prices are of no use in predicting future prices. Well, stock prices do tend to demonstrate momentum. They tend to rise more often than they fall because why the, the global economy is growing more often than it falls. Uh, they tend to move far higher than is usually justified, a mania, a bubble, or far lower than is usually warranted, a crash. And this is a famous quote from a, a Sir John Maynard Keynes, a, a, an economist whose, whose work was credited with getting us out of the Great Depression and then whose subsequent uh, theories have held up over the decades, although he has, his, he has his detractors. They helped us out of the Great Recession also. He was once asked by a group of investors, why is the market so irrational? How These prices are way too high. These were people who were shorting stocks, hoping they would go down and losing their shirts. Because if <laughs> you short a stock and it goes up, you're in deep kimchi. And they said, Mr. Keynes, uh, Sir Keynes, how can the market stay so irrational? And he said, the market stay, can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. And he was right. <laughs> This happened to a buddy of mine in, in the mid-2000s when he kept saying housing prices are way too high and he kept betting against them. And I begged him and pleaded him not to do it, pleaded him not to do this. You can lose a lot of money. He did. He lost a lot of money. He was just too soon. He should have waited until 2007 and eight. He was doing it in five and six. So if this theory is true, then technical analysis, which we're going to cover in the next chapter, is actually useless that past data on stock prices are of no use in predicting future prices. Well, the technical analysts say, no, 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 you're wrong. They are. I don't believe them <laughs> because as the efficient market theorists and many others have shown, in the short term, stock prices are random. The semi-strong efficiency hypothesis. Abnormally large profits cannot be consistently earned using publicly available information. What? In other words, no amount of analysis that you do to determine the future price of a stock will help you beat the market. Well, excuse me. There are many, many investors, we'll look at a few, who have done that uh, over decades. So... You got a theory that says nobody can do it. How come there are some people who do it? So what does the theory say about those investors? Well, they are just lucky. Just lucky. I mean, if you have 10,000 people, one of them is going to beat the market over time. When they're wrong. That's so wrong because it's not just one. There are many who have done it over serious amounts of time. And so I like to think of sports analogies or, or maybe opera. I mean, can you sing a four-hour opera? Most of us couldn't even begin to. Can you hit a little white ball 400 yards down the fairway in four shots? Can you 
throw a fastball at 98 miles an hour? Can you hit a fastball at 98 miles an hour? You know, most of us can't do these things, but there are some people who can. And it gets back to a, a story that's attributed to many golfers, although I don't know which one it actually is. If you look it up on the internet, you'll see it's lots of different golfers. And he was really, really good, and he did. He beat everybody else, and the reporter said, boy, you are really lucky out there today. And the, the golfer said, yep, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, and the funny thing is, the more I practice, the luckier I get. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Investing is like that, I believe. The more you practice, the better are you, you better you're going to get at it. And look, you don't have to be as good as the pros. That's the cool thing about investing. If you're a major league baseball player and you get a hit 10, three times out of 10, means you're a 300 batter, you're going to make a, you know, a lot of money. <laughs> you're going to be very famous. Whereas if you follow the concepts and techniques that we use and then learn some others, you know, learn the ones that you like, find the sources that you trust and, uh, and make the judgments that, that you believe are, are going to happen, what's going to happen in the future. You don't have, you're going to do better than a 300 hitter in baseball. You're going to, you know, you don't have to be able to dunk a, a, a basketball or dunk two of them at the same time. You don't have to be superhuman to do well in investing. Which is the cool thing. That's the cool thing in my humble opinion. Okay? So, if this theory is true, and I don't believe it is, then fundamental analysis, which we've covered in chapters 6 and 17 and a little bit, in the previous two chapters and a little bit in chapter 5, is useless. They're basically saying, no matter what we do, forget it. <laughs> I don't agree. Slide number 5. The strong efficiency hypothesis. No information, public or private, allows investors to earn abnormally large profits consistently. Oh, this is obviously false. One insider information trade can make you rich overnight. If you don't get caught, that is. If you had what the legal folks call material non-public information, we call it insider information, if you had material non-public information about a company, you could make a fortune overnight, but you can also go to jail. <laughs> it's called insider trading. And does it happen? Oh, yes, it does, but it's illegal. And uh, don't do it. Okay? So obviously this one is ridiculous. Ridiculous. Market efficiency rationale. The random walk and efficient market theorists are also often major proponents of index funds. They point to the fact that many professional money managers simply do not beat the market, especially during bull markets. They tend to do better during bear markets. From 63 to 1998, the S&P 500 index outperformed general equity mutual funds 22 out of 36 times. Well, this is not a good comparison just to begin with because remember the S&P 500 index includes <coughs> excuse me includes <coughs> excuse me both value and growth stocks realizing that our term for value means less risky stocks and so therefore you should remove all the equity income funds right off the bat because they're not trying to match the S&P 500 so right then and there you get rid of all those because they're not trying to to, to to, uh, to, to include growth. But it's true. Mutual funds have a major disadvantage. The S&P 500 index doesn't have any transaction costs. It doesn't have any, any, uh, any uh, 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 research costs. It doesn't have people all over the world uh, banging on doors of companies and interviewing the company and their competitors and their... their uh, their, their customers and their, and their vendors. Yeah, it, it's not a fair comparison. But still, they say, no, 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 no. You are better off accepting close to the market's return with a low-cost index fund. Since their theory tells them that no one can consistently beat the market, 
even though there are mutual funds that have beaten the market over 10, 20, 30, 50, 80 years. We saw one that's done over 80 years. And we saw, we saw them in chapter four, remember? Yes, I agree. So it reminds me of the bumblebee, the humble bumblebee. You know, very quickly, humans at the beginning of the 20th century figured out many of the uh, characteristics of flight. And they realized how uh, birds could fly. And of course, we can't fly the way birds can fly. And they figured out most insects could fly. But they couldn't figure out how a bumblebee could fly. In fact, it, their theory, their knowledge, told them that the bumblebee shouldn't be able to fly. And it took until the 1990s, almost the end of the century, for the uh, experts in bumblebees to figure out, oh, that's how they're doing it. It's a good thing nobody told the bumblebees they couldn't fly. Hmm? Indeed. There are people who can beat the markets, who have beaten the markets over significant, statistically significant periods of time. And those are the ones we're going to uh, look at. So why can't the pros beat the averages? Well, many mutual funds have high annual operating expenses and high turnover rates. Many mutual fund managements also have a short time horizon. So they have a short lifespan. <laughs> well, as we said when we were in chapter four, and it's changing, it's changing. Most mutual fund companies realize this is not the way to do business now because some of them have not been doing this way for a long time and they're the ones who have done the best over the long period of time. Uh, you give your mutual fund manager four, eight, 12 years. You don't give them 16 months or 18 months because it encourages short-term bet taking, They're taking large bets in the short term, because if they win, great, they get to stick around, get showered with love and attention, a whole lot of money. And if they lose, oh, well, they're going to get kicked out anyway if they didn't do well. But now we see mutual funds have, taking longer term um, time horizons, and I believe that it's for all for the better. But the premises and casual observations of the efficient market theories show them to be patently absurd. There are many mutual fund managers and many other managers who have beaten the market over statistically significant periods of time. The more I practice, the better I get. Plus, dear students, if markets are efficient and are rational, how do you explain manias, bubbles? Occasionally, investors get caught up in what are called manias. The internet mania, the internet bubble of the late 1990s was the latest stock mania. Many people say we're living in a current stock mania, but I don't agree fully. Certainly some stocks are outrageously priced, but not all. Many are, are, are very uh, reasonably priced for long-term uh, um, growth and income. In my humble opinion, remember, everybody has their opinion. <laughs> And they look at the situation differently. Uh, but but uh, but certainly uh, some of the stocks, you know, you look at Shopify and, and Tesla and you just say, look, they're, they're, they have to be just, you have to be incredibly optimistic about the future of those companies for, to justify the prices. But it, at, the, at the market as a whole, no, I don't believe it. I do believe there's a lot of stocks that are very expensive but not mania expensive. In the 1960s, late 1960s, early 1970s, there was the Nifty 50. These were companies that, don't worry, you can buy them. Doesn't matter what price you pay for them. They're always going to go up. They're all gone, like, uh, like Metro Media and Calcomp and Tektronix and, uh, and Polaroid. Polaroid. I would never buy a company that rhymed with whose name rhymed with hemorrhoid. The name's still around, by the way, but the company's long gone. The mania of the 1920s created the crash of 1929. Radio Corporation of America. You've heard of them, haven't you? RCA. They sold for $290, I think it was, in, uh, in late 1929, right before the crash. 
and four years later sold for $2. The mania of the 1840s was railroads. There were 400 railroad firms. How many are there now? Four. <laughs> yeah, about three actually big ones. The granddaddy of all manias was the tulip, Dutch tulip bulb craze of the 1600s. Now this is a, now it's getting a little more attention. It's getting a little bit more uh, skepticism. But there are two wonderful books, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and The Madness of Crowds and The Botany of Desire, both that discuss the uh, internet. I mean, not the internet, the, the tulip bulb crazes. And uh, it was obviously a craze. Whether it was as bad as it, the people make it out to be it was, is up for historical debate. But you really ought to read the popular delusion, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and The Madness of Crowds. Why? It won't tell you why. Because... There really is no reason why we're irrational. I mean, it's just how we we developed. We're, we're, we evolved this way. But we are not a rational uh, uh, being. We are, <laughs> you know, humans are not. We are very irrational. We're ruled by our emotions. Have you figured that out? That's what I've been saying all, we've been saying all semester long. You have to worry about the intellectual part. That's actually pretty straightforward. The emotional part of investing is, very tricky. And one of my students said it really well. He said, it's easier to fool 100 million people than it is to fool one. And that's why we have these incredible uh, conspiracy theories now that where a large segment of the population believe these, there's no basis in reality, it doesn't matter, just as long as you believe it. In this book, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowns, you will learn about witchcraft and witches, and you'll learn about uh, how people believe that witches were real, and you'll learn about the Crusades, which was a total farce from the beginning, and some of the major uh, financial uh, manias of the 1700s and 1600s. Quite, it's quite a read. The Botany of Desire is another wonderful book that you may want to read. I know you guys love books. I know you. You can, you can download them on your phone. You don't even have to go to the library anymore. And it talks about our relationship with plants, how we believe we control the plants. But no, 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 no. The plants control us. They get them to plant them, to, to feed them, to, to get rid of the plants, the, the plants that they're competing with. Yeah, think about it. Yeah, Do we rule corn or does corn rule us? So please do read about the manias of the past because each time you hear people say in the mania, it's a new era. It's different this time. The old way of valuing stock are gone. You're hearing this about cryptocurrencies and NFTs now. And each time, eventually, they're wrong. So much for rational, efficient markets. We're not rational. Why do manias occur over and over again? Why haven't investors learned their lesson? Any ideas, dear students? Well, here's a great quote from Leonard Kaplan, president of commodities brokerage firm Prospector Asset Management in Evanston, Illinois. Market manias will happen over and over again because the public is infinitely stupid. <laughs> I like that. Also, here's Mr. Benjamin Graham. Remember Warren Buffett's teacher? The speculative public is incorrigible. It will buy anything at any price if there seems to be some action in progress. It will fall for any company identified in, with franchising, computers, electronics, science, technology, or what have you when the particular fashion is raging. The abuses are so largely the result of the public's own heedlessness and greed. Now, this is from the last edition, 1972, of Intelligent Investor. Since then, there have been subsequent editions, but Mr. Benjamin Graham died in 1975, so it's all the 72 edition, except what they've done is they've added commentary by a very competent, famous financial writer, Jason Swig, who... You read Benjamin Graham's uh, chapter, one chapter, and then you're thoroughly confused, or maybe you understand what he's talking about. And then there comes a commentary where Mr. Swig says, well, this is what Mr. Bam, 
Graham was saying, okay? Because he's, he writes very opaquely, uh, meaning it's hard to read his stuff. And then he, there's another chapter, and then Mr. Schweig. So that's, what you, that's the one you want to read. And so this was 1972 when he wrote this. Replace franchising, computers, etc., with internet biotechnology, and good old Ben could have been writing in 2000 instead of 1972. Today, what are the buzzwords? Social disease, I'm sorry, social networking, cryptocurrencies, and marijuana. <laughs> yeah, the speculative public is incorrigible, and you're not going to be one of them. Crashes. Slide number 11. How do most manias end? Well, you guessed it. They invariably end with a crash. I love the saying, the bigger the party, the bigger the hangover. They are not fun, but the odds are you will live through at least one during your investing career. Now, this was a quote from a gentleman in August of 1999. And I'm sure many people thought the man was quite mad. With this many strong years, I have the concern that there are a vast majority of companies that are significantly overvalued on a long-term basis. Now, when he said that, we had had four years, 96, 97, 98, and then into 1999, and even 1995 was pretty strong also, where the stock market had gone in two directions, up and way up. And this, is guy, at th at th this guy at this time had almost 50 years of experience, at 49 and a half years of experience. He was the uh, one, more than anyone else, responsible for the, the, uh, the tremendous growth of the American funds. He passed away in 2008. And read about him, because he's quite a, quite a character. Quite a character. Um, oh, by the way, the 2008-2009 market crash was not caused by a stock market bubble. It was a real estate bubble and the mortgage-backed bonds that were tied to the mortgages of that real estate. So don't blame the stock market on 2008-9. Last year, our crash was, we can blame on one thing, a little microbe, right? And here they are, folks, the 13 worst days of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, going back to 1896. And you'll find that the worst day, now notice, they talk about the point drop. That's useless. Don't look at the point drop, even though we've included it here. It's the percentage decline that's important. The worst day, 1987, October 19th, 22.5%. It went down in one day. You had $10,000. You now had 7,700. 70, you know. That's one day, folks. <laughs> uh, 100,000, 70,000. Yeah, it's, 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 those are, they make your stomach churn. Notice in 2020, last year, it was COVID. It wasn't the stock market. that, that It wasn't the fact that the market was overpriced. It was the fact that people believed, oh my gosh, the world's going to end. In which case, it doesn't matter where your money is. And then they quickly realized, no, wait a minute. The world's not going to end. Civilization will continue bumping along as it's always has. We're just going to lose a whole lot of people. Only a couple million people are going to die. But we'll get through this. And so we had the quickest bear market and the quickest recovery on his, in history because people realize, this, oh, yeah, this just is a microbe that's going to kill a lot of people. Oh, well. Oh, well. Sorry for them. Anyway, when you look through this list of 13 days, you'll find that six of them are in October. One is in early November. Now, wait a minute. If it were evenly distributed, we'd maybe see one or two in October, one or two in, in every other of the uh, 12 months of the year. But why do we see far more crashes in October and early November? Well, there have been theories put forward. None of them are any good because, first of all, they don't make any sense except for the one I have. But none of them can be proved, so it doesn't really matter. But the theory I have, <laughs> I think, is the real reason. But again, you can't prove it. And it gets back to the fact that we are not rational individuals. We are still animals. <laughs> Even though we like to divorce ourselves from the animal kingdom, 
We are Homo sapiens Homo. Isn't that isn't our isn't that our designation? And so we evolved over hundreds of thousands, millions of years to be who we are. And although our technology has evolved much faster than us, we're still those same petty, kind, cruel, bizarre, irrational beings from 100,000 years ago. And 100,000 years ago, and 10,000, and 1,000 years, and even a couple hundred years ago, when October rolled around, <laughs> we saw the light dying. Yeah, we saw the, the days getting shorter, and the wind kicking up, and the crops in the fields that were dying, as we had to get them out of the fields quickly and save them. And there's a reason why All Hallows' Eve, All Souls' Day, All Saints' Day, Day of the Dead, Halloween, is in the fall. We even call it the fall. And we looked around and we realized that, you know, some of us aren't going to be around to make it through the winter. And people say, well, why isn't it December? Why isn't it the winter? No, that's the birth of light. That's when we finally say, hey, <laughs> the, the, the days have stopped getting shorter and now they're going to start getting longer. And that's why we have Christmas the birth of light. Jesus was the light of the world. They don't really know when he was born. Um, yeah, that's the time of death. That's the time of death. And so there's no way to prove this. You can't go around and ask every single person who sold on October 19th, 1987, why they sold. They panicked. We panicked. And we, we and, that, and that's what we do well. We do that well. When we see a whole bunch of people running a certain way, what do we do? We run that way. <laughs> yeah, nothing wrong with it. That's what kept us alive because the people who stuck, st stood around and looked like, why are those people running? They're the ones that got eaten by the tiger. But in the world of finance, in the world of investments, that's the wrong thing to do, <laughs> to follow the crowd because you'll get eaten by the ti this big tiger that's waiting to eat everybody. Makes sense? Eh, you think about it. You decide if I'm off my rocker or not, which I probably am, but it doesn't matter. I think this is right. Slide number 13, which that brings us back. <laughs> this brings us back to our discussion of index funds that we had in chapter four. And now this is going to make more sense because you now understand what PE is. PE is. Would you, you understand what price to earnings ratio is? Recall that index funds and most ETFs are index funds, but there are many actively managed ETFs, exchange-traded exchange -traded, exchange -traded funds now. They rely on indices. Instead of trying to beat the market, just buy the market, be happy with the market's return, a little bit less because of the tiny transaction costs, um, operating annual operating expenses. But sometimes, as we said back in Chapter 4, an index can become skewed especially when a sector or a region becomes hot. So now this is going to make more sense. In the 1980s, the Japanese stock market went in two directions, up and way, way, way up, until at the end of the 80s, Japan was 60% of the IFA, Europe, Australia, and the Far East, you know, Western Europe, Canada, uh, Australia, South Africa, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Japan. And everybody else, other than Japan, made up 40%. And the Japanese stock market was at a 51.9, 52 PE, which we know to be pretty darn high, whereas everybody else is at 13. So you thought you were buying a broadly based international index when actually you were buying 60% Japan. The Japanese stock market then went on to lose over 80% of its value. The Standard & Poor's 500 at the end of the, at the, end of the 1990s, <clears throat> March of 2000, had gone in two directions, up and way up, almost 20% over the 10-year period. And people bought into the S&P 500 thinking there was a broadly based index when reality was that you were getting one-third of information technology, internet companies, computer companies, telecommunication companies, 
with a PE of 59, even higher than Japan, where everything else, everything, you know, everything, hospitals, health care, uh, uh, energy, uh, materials, uh, 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 consumer staples, defense, everybody else was at a P of 19, which is, you know, kind of high by historical standards, but nowhere near as 59. And then over the next two and a half years, the S&P 500 lost almost 50%. The NASDAQ, as which represents the information technology sector of the economy, lost 80%. Right. <clears throat> Indexes, funds are not perfect investments. Nothing is. Every investment has advantages. Every investment has, disadvantages. has disadvantages. And if you did the Chapter 4 bonus assignment, which you can still do, folks. Go back and do it. I hope you do you'll see that the top 10 funds in the S, I'm sorry, top 10 companies in the S&P 500 make up almost 30% of the index. Some of you did the top 10, but you, you actually wound up using Google twice because Google comes, comes in at five and six or five and seven because Google has two different share classes. So really it was the top nine. <laughs> And so people are buying the S&P 500 and are thinking that they have a broadly based, oh, I got 500 companies. Yeah, but 10 of them make up almost 3, 30%. 50 of them make up over 50%. So are you really diversified? Now, I'm not trying to bad mouth in any way, shape, or form uh, the top companies like, like, uh, like uh, Facebook and Tesla and Amazon and Apple and and Microsoft, and who else? Berkshire Hathaway, Visa's up there too, Johnson & Johnson. I'm not trying to badmouth those companies. I'm just saying, you're not diversified, folks. Maybe you don't want to be. Maybe you like the fact that those companies. But I just have a hard time believing. I mean, 10 years ago, what was Apple's market cap? I forget. It was like 600, 900. Nine, it's now 2, bill, 2 trillion, 600 or so billion. Now it's 2 trillion. Now you think it's going to go to six trillion or ten trillion in the next ten years? Is Tesla with a, whatever it is seven eight hundred billion? Is that going to go to two billion, or two trillion, or five trillion? Like, I don't mean I'm right, <laughs> but like Mr. Lovelace, I have a distinct feeling that some companies are priced to perfection. <laughs> Over for the long term basis, overpriced for for gen for for long term growth and income. Doesn't mean I'm right. We'll find out. See you in ten years. Okay, the argument for active management, which I like to throw around because I always want to be the devil's advocate. Because there are people who just say, "Ah, oh, you always have to have index funds." Oh yeah, and they try to get them to think otherwise. Today in the financial media, index funds and ETFs are touted as the better alternative to actively managed mutual funds. As we saw, index funds do have the advantage of very low cost indexing, unless the bums, your third party administrator sneaks a high cost index fund into your 401k, catch them and make those jerks in the three piece suit look bad in front of your other employees. Your, co your fellow employees, but decades ago, in The Intelligent Investor, Mr. Benjamin Graham warmed against any investment strategy that relied on deterministic or robotic decision-making and removed the element of human judgment. And that's what an index fund does. It removes the element of human judgment. You're just buying the top 500 companies by market capitalization in the United States when you buy the S&P 500. Now, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of wiggle room around the edges, but no, it's a, that's what you're mostly buying. So when people tell me about index funds, I say, well, make sure you get the Wilshire 5000 one, right? Whatever that is now, the U.S. total stock market index. But that's not even 5,000 companies. They don't bother to go after all 5,000. They just pick and choose randomly. Again, it's a robotic decision-making process, and I don't like it, and neither does Mr. Benjamin Graham. And now here's a gentleman with over 35 years of experience. I think he's retired now. But as with any human, human endeavor, whether it is athletic competition, the performing arts, or technological innovation, some people clearly perform at a higher than average level. 
And this guy ought to know. He was the proud, <laughs> proud owner of the most zeros in his company. What does that mean? He bought companies that went to zero. <laughs> Remember the companies that we said could go from $5 to $50 or 50 cents? He had the distinct, the dubious distinction of having the most. However, he also had the dubious distinction of, of destroying all the competition. He, he, in other words, he was the. I don't know if this helps. You know, you you, fan, you baseball fans. He swung for the fences. If you know about that, if you if you swing in for the fences, what do you do? You strike out a lot, and he was willing to accept that, and he did well doing that. Uh, for me, it's not something I want to do, but he did very well with it. <laughs> So there's the case for active management. Now, let's spend a little time talking about some silliness. How are we doing for time? Oh, Piano, you got to speed it up a little bit here. My apologies. I can talk longer about investments than most anybody would ever want to listen. Timing theories. Monday is the best day to buy, or maybe it's the best day to sell. I don't remember. Read about the effect. How about the January effect? As, go Jan as goes January, so goes the year. Well, that, you could say that about March. As goes March, so goes the year. You could say that about you know any month. Because as we said, the market goes up about three times more often than it goes down. The Santa Claus rally. Whenever December rolls around, there, there's always a rally. No, there's not. <laughs> if there's a rally, they call it the Santa Claus rally. And if there's a downturn, they call it profit taking. Oh, yeah, people are trying to lock in profits before the end of the year. Or lock in losses? I don't know. Are you going to go out and ask every individual investor? Are you... Sell in May and go away. No, there's some truth to this. It turns out that the best times of the, of the markets have been November to March. The worst times are September to October. But that's on a long-term basis. And the, and, and the, and the amount is, is you know, statistically not significant enough so that you could actually trade on these values. On these, on these, on these ideas, and of course, you know, you have to worry about taxes and transaction costs. That's why I'm a buy and hold kind of guy. And every year they trot out this thing, and it just drives me up a wall. It's called the Super Bowl theory. If the National League wins, that's bullish for the market, and if the American League wins, that's bearish. The weird thing is, you go back in time, and it. And it correlates. <laughs> it cor and you think, Ooh, doo, 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 doo. well, it's just coincidence. I don't know if you ever heard the the uh, the story about the um, the Wizard of Oz and the movie, The Wizard of Oz, and the Plink Floyd album, one of the largest selling albums of the 20th century, Dark Side of the Moon. If you turn on Dark Side of the Moon and then start watching uh, the uh, Wizard of Oz, the music changes with the scenes in an eerie fashion. And uh, people went back to, the, uh, to, the, uh, the, to the, the band, Pink Floyd, and the producer, Alan Parsons, and said, w were you guys thinking of the, the, uh, the, uh, dark, uh, the uh, Wizard of Oz? And they looked at him, <laughs> are you out of your minds? Well, when you think of the thousands of albums and the thousands of movies, yeah, one of them, one pair is going to work together just because of pure numbers. The hemlines of skirts. In the 1920s and 1960s, hemlines were going up. So was the stock market. But in the 1930s and 1970s, skirts were, hemlines were going down and so was the market. There are many other silly theories, such as the lipstick indicator, the Boston snow indicator, also called the BS indicator, hot waitress indicator, the aspirin count theory, and they're all just silliness, in my humble opinion. Now, let's take a, just a moment to talk about politics and the stock market. Which political party in the United States, both of which have been around for you know over 100 and some other... Well, the Republican Party is from 1850. Democrats are before that. Which one's been better for the markets? A, many people would say it's the Republicans. Wrong, it's the Democrats. But a lot of that's just dumb luck. <laughs> you know, uh, 1929, Hoover. And then who comes in? A Democrat. The market comes out. And it's not, you know, he helped, uh, certainly, 
but it was just dumb luck on the Hoover's part. Same thing happened with uh, with Nixon in 1972, three and four, and then Reagan in 1987, and then Bush the uh, younger in 2000. He comes into office, the market crashes. So so both parties, you know, you'll hear people say that the Democrats are socialists and commies. No, no, no. Both parties are dedicated to free market capitalism. Now, there's a lot of argument in the middle where the... the uh, where this, the lines are drawn over how much, you know, capitalism should we have and how much ah, socialism, you know. Uh, people downplay socialism. So, yeah, you know, that government, that United States government is so socialist that you know the most socialistic part of the government, the most socialist organization in the United States of Armenia, America, is the Defense Department. You get a housing allowance, you get your medical, you get money for kids if you have kids. And people say, well, Woody, you don't like our army? You don't like our armed forces? And that's not what I'm saying. And I'm not saying they don't deserve it. I'm just saying that sometimes it makes sense. Do you really want, and we had a discussion about this during the class this semester, do you really want to have competing fire departments? And uh, police departments <laughs> or water authorities, yeah. there's plenty of give and take in the middle, and that's where we need to meet because we can get things done there. Okay, enough said. Oh, my goodness. All right, real quickly, because I've talked long enough, my apologies. All stars of investing. Now, these are people you really, really should uh, study, folks. There's plenty of stuff on the Internet about them. I have some websites that point to these gentlemen, and specifically Mr. Sir John Templeton, but Peter Lynch, you're going to read One Up on Wall Street, right? Read One Up on Wall Street. He was the fund manager of Fidelity's Magellan Mutual Fund, which is the reason why it has this outrageously high return, even though it hasn't had that return in decades. He racked up 29% a year. Mm -hmm. So read One Up on Wall Street. Warren Buffett, we've talked about him. He said, don't buy a stock, buy a company. In other words, if you wanted to really own Johnson & Johnson, if you could, you'd could, you be happy to own that company if you could come up with the $200 billion or whatever it is it was to, to buy them. Go ahead, buy 10 shares, okay? So think of it as an entire company. And Benjamin Graham, we've made mention to him over and over and over again. He was Warren Buffett's teacher. He was often called the father of value investing. He wrote The Intelligent Investor and Security Analysis. Security analysis is pretty tough, but a lot of the stuff we, we do in this class is what you, what you learn in security analysis. And he spends far too much time on, on uh, preferred stock, which most of, most of us are not interested in. And then Sir John Templeton, pretty good for a kid from Tennessee. One of the first mutual fund managers excuse me, to invest globally. Uh, so let's take a look at what they have to say. Oh, and before we do, let's take a look at Mr. Bill Miller on slide 17. He was the fund manager of the Lake Mason Value Trust, which is now called the Clear Bridge Value Trust. For 15 calendar years in a row, he beat the S&P 500, an unprecedented record, similar to that, that, uh, that, that Padre who we now revere. What's I can losing his name again, but he, he won the batting championship seven times. I mean, just unprecedented. He became, unfortunately for him, as far as I'm concerned, oh, Tony Gwynn, that's his name, the financial media's megastar. Uh, but then in 19, 2006, he, he, he didn't beat the S&P 500 after doing it 15 years in a row. And then he really badly lagged in 2007 and eight. And he seemed to turn himself around 2009 and then got trounced in 2010 and 11 and they let him retire in 2012. It's a tough business, dear students. What do all these people have in common? Courage to not follow the crowd. The unconventional, the conventional wisdom is not usually not very wise. And what I uh, like to see in people is what I call that an eye for unrecognized value. Uh, you might think of it as a sixth sense. Right? Everybody sees 
this with regard to a company. And these people say, oh, no, you, you're missing this. You're missing what's going on here. All right? Uh, you're looking at just the numbers, but look at what's happened. This is what Amazon was doing throughout the 2000s. They're, they're, they were losing money and losing money. But the good mutual fund managers are saying, but look at what they're doing. Look at what they're setting up for later on. Yeah. Uh, Gary Kasparov and Anatoly Karpov were the two best chess players in the world. And then the, you know, one would beat the other, and then they beat the other one. They go back and forth until finally Gary Kasparov became the undisputed champion, and then he got beat by a computer. But he was once asked why he and Anatoly Karpov were the two best chess players in the world. And his answer was astonishingly simple and direct. He said, we attack better than anybody else, and we defend better than anybody else. Can, <laughs> yeah, indeed. Can you throw that fastball at 98 miles an hour? Can you hit the fastball at 98 miles an hour? Well, with regard to investing, these all-stars of investments bought the best companies and they avoided the worst companies. You see, it's there's. do you play good offense or do you play good defense? I prefer defense. I want to avoid the worst companies. I want to get good companies too. So speaking of avoidance, as a mutual fund investor, which I mostly am, you know, I play with my own stocks, but mostly everything's in mutual funds that I trust. I am not looking to find the next Peter Lynch or the next Bill Miller or the next Warren Buffett. I'm looking to avoid the next Charles Stedman. And you may say, you may ask, who's Charles Stedman? There's a reason why you don't know about him. Look it up, though. He's, he's been immortalized, unfortunately for him. He ran his own mutual fund. That's a bad thing. You, call it, you, you name it after yourself. That's a bad sign. The Stedman American Industry Fund from December 1959 until his death in late 1997. His cumulative total return was minus 42.9%. He would have done much better simply placing his investors' funds into a savings account at a bank. He would have done better putting it into a mattress. I don't know, maybe he came from the life insurance industry. Uh -huh. Remember, we're going to insult everybody by the end of the semester. So I'm not looking for the next Bill Miller, the next Peter Lynch, the next Charles, next next uh, um, uh, Sir John Templeton. I mean, I'm, I love to find them, but I'm looking to avoid this person. And I want you to not be like him. I'm looking to I'm looking to avoid that you'll be like him. So here's Mr. Warren Buffett when he says, "Be fearful when others are greedy, but be greedy when others are fearful." You see what he's saying? He's saying, "Look." When well, everybody's running this way, you run the other way. He's a contrarian. And his mentor, Benjamin Graham, said it this way. Buy when most people, including experts, are overly pessimistic and sell when they are actively optimistic. But it ain't easy. Sir John Templeton said, bear markets are born of pessimism, grow on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die on euphoria. The time of maximum pessimism is the best time to buy. It's also the hardest. Because <laughs> on a similar note, he said, to buy when others are despondently selling and sell when others are avidly buying requires the greatest fortitude and pays the greatest reward. Now, did Sir John Templeton follow his own advice? Oh, yeah. December 1941, you historian fans, you history fans, what happened in December 1941? The United States is dragged into World War II. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, naval base in Pearl Harbor is bombed, and one-third of the Pacific Fleet, thankfully not the aircraft carriers, is destroyed. What did Mr. John Templeton, he wasn't, a, he wasn't a, a, a knight yet, he called his broker and asked his broker to buy shares of every bankrupt company on the New York Stock Exchange. Right, right. The <laughs> fascism looks like it's going to take over the world. The United States is caught flat-footed and enters World War II. And this Yahoo is buying bankrupt companies. Well, four years later, the war is over, and Mr. John Templeton is a very wealthy man. Slide 22. Let's take a look at some famous myths and stupid sayings, because they are stupid. It can't go any lower. Oh, yes, it can. <laughs> Once it hits zero, it can't go any lower. But until then, it can go lower. It can't go any higher. Oh, yes, it can. There's no 
There's no speed limit. If the earnings are continuing to grow, there's no limit to how high the price can go. It's only $3 a share. What can I lose? $3. It doesn't matter what the price is. The price can go to zero. You can lose all your money. Price is not important. Valuation, market capitalization is the key. It has to come back. Have you ever heard of Penn Central or Transworld Airlines or Polaroid? <laughs> it's always darkest before the dawn. Well, sometimes it's always darkest before it's pitch black, dear students. And when it rebounds to ten dollars, I'll sell. Now I understand this. This is very typical. We'll get we'll get back into this into into uh, in the next chapter because people, humans, we don't like to admit we made a mistake. We bought it at 10, it's now selling at six or three. And we say, well, when it gets back to 10, I'll sell. And then I didn't make a mistake. No, 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 no. If you would not buy it at the price it is right now, it's time to sell. And the cool thing about this, is, is, well, we'll pro I'll probably repeat myself, my apologies. But if you hang on to a loser, see, in the next chapter we'll talk about selling don't sell your winners. Hang on to your winners. Sell your losers. You'll be always reminded of how stupid you were by buying that stock because you always look at it when you look at your portfolio. If you sell it, your bra our brains are hardwired to forget bad experiences. If it goes down 10% sell, now I know that people will tell you, hey, set a stop loss at 10% or 20%. But the problem with this, I know they're trying to, they're trying to keep you from having large losses, stock prices fluctuate greatly, even blue chip stocks. If you sold each stock that lost 10%, you'd always, always wind up selling your winners along with your looters, losers, and selling your winners is usually a bad idea. It's taking too long. Well, dear students, patience is an investor's most important trait, along with humility, I believe. And besides, it gives you a chance to buy more, right? <laughs> Look at all the money I lost. I didn't buy it. <laughs> no, no, no. You didn't lose a cent by not buying a stock that did well. Don't fret over it. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. I missed that one. I'll catch the next one. Well, the problem is the next one rarely makes it. Why wait for the next Google or the next Microsoft? It's not going to happen again like that. There's going to be a next Google or Microsoft, but they're going to be entirely different industries. Now, there was, there are, there's always an exception. Look at Home Depot. The next Home Depot, Lowe's, right? So there's always an exception, but but the next one rarely makes it. Uh, look at and speaking of Microsoft and Google, look at Microsoft's attempts to to overtake Google with Bing. How many of you Bing your <laughs> your searches? The stock's gone up. I must be a genius. The stock's gone down. I must be an idiot. No, no. There's a saying for that. Never mistake a bull market for brains. Yeah, just because the stock's gone up doesn't mean you're a genius. It doesn't mean because it's gone down, you're not, you're not an idiot. It could be something completely out of your control and the company's control. It's different this time. Well, technically, yes, it's different every time, but that doesn't mean you should pay an astronomical price for a company that probably will never make a dollar's worth of profit. And this was so, so true of the internet stocks. It's a new era. Uh, yeah, when you hear this one, it's time to sell. It's a permanent trend. What? A permanent trend? That's an oxymoron. Like jumbo shrimp or straight curve. There ain't no such things. Markets move in cycles. So we'll discuss the trend is your friend when we get to... Uh, uh, next chapter in technical analysis. And stocks are too risky. Well, you know what, dear students? Even with all the shenanigans and the stupidity and the greed and the... They're still the best long-term financial investment. Well, that's what history tells us. Is it a guarantee for the future? I think you know my answer. <laughs> yes. And so, dear students, that was our discussion of stock price behavior and market efficiency. And some of it was silly and some of it was important, I think, to understand. But next chapter, we even get sillier. <laughs>
when we discuss behavioral finance and the psychology, I'm um, psychology of investing, and then skewer technical analysis. See you in our next chapter.